for continuing to take your questions throughout this evening's broadcast. Using the hashtag AskNASA, be sure to throw us your questions and we'll be sure to answer as many as we can throughout the evening. Next one coming to us, once again, about food. Will the crew share Thanksgiving dinner with the other astronauts on the International Space Station? Well, we do have a couple of special food items that can be used for Thanksgiving dinner for the crew members. Some of those special food items that the crew is looking forward to include smoked turkey, as well as roasted turkey. They'll have cornbread dressing, mashed potatoes, candied yams, butternut squash, sweet and savory kale, green beans, and you can't forget the dessert, they'll also have a cran apple dessert. So they'll pretty much have the entire spread of a traditional American Thanksgiving meal. But we also oftentimes hear that crew members on board station like to trade out foods because it is the International Space Station. There's often some different types of cuisines that they like to swap and trade for. So I'm sure we'll get some great photos of their Thanksgiving meal and I'm looking forward to seeing what they'll have. We also have another question related to food. Asking about the crew's meal that they eat before launch, which is called the ultimate meal. Before today's launch, the crew members got to choose what they were going to eat for their ultimate meal. This crew chose fish sandwich, burger, and chicken. They had sides consisting of bacon-wrapped asparagus, fries, salads, waffles, and strawberries. My personal favorite there. And for desserts, they had fresh fruits, ice cream, chocolate chip cookie, peanut butter pie, Now that the crew is on orbit, the Space Food Research Facility produces heat stabilized foods and pouches, similar to military meals or ready to eat meals or MREs. The crew got to choose their food selections for those MREs, and they enjoyed uh, just a little bit ago their first in-flight meal. The crew got to eat chicken and beef fajitas, chicken with peanut sauce, barbecued beef brisket, and smoked turkey. For the sides, they had some mixed vegetables, tomato basil soup, applesauce, a little bit and ago wheat flatbread eat chicken and beef fajitas, chicken with peanut sauce, barbecued beef brisket, and smoked turkey. For the sides, they had some mixed vegetables, tomato basil soup, applesauce, and wheat flatbread. And of course, they had to have dessert, which consisted of cherry blueberry cobbler. And of course, some snacks along the way consisting of nuts and dried fruits and fruit bars.
The next question coming to us from the hashtag Ask NASA. What is the significance behind the turtle zero G indicator? And this is a really good question, one that we actually had to do a little bit of investigating on our own about because we were curious too. We spoke with the flight director and the current Capcom, Josh Cassida, who happens to be a member of the turtle astronaut class himself. And we're thinking that the zero G indicator being a turtle plays into the significance of two of the crew members on board, crew three being a member of the turtle class. It's their first time in space, so a really special moment for this class as a whole. So we'll probably get some confirmation from the crew in the coming days about why they chose the turtle as well as if they named the turtle, but if we had to guess, that's what we're thinking the zero G indicator is as of this moment. And we're getting some great cabin views of the crew now. Perhaps we'll see that turtle float by. We're certainly looking forward to learning more about the choice of that zero G indicator and if he or she has a name. Speaking of naming, you may have noticed that Dragon also has a name, Endurance. Since the beginning of the US space program, astronauts have had the opportunity to name their spacecraft, starting with Alan Shepard naming his spacecraft Freedom 7 during the Mercury program. In keeping with this tradition, each of the NASA Dragon spacecraft astronaut crews have had the opportunity to select a name for their Dragon. Crew 3 has chosen the name Endurance for their Dragon, which Raja Chari, the spacecraft's uh, commander, has said uh, is a tribute to the tenacity of the human spirit. The crew has also expressed that the name acknowledges the teams of people who endured through a pandemic to make this mission possible. Endurance will be joining Endeavor and Resilience as the third NASA Crew Dragon spacecraft to take astronauts to the International Space Station. Dragon SpaceX for camera cap.
SpaceX Dragon, go ahead. We noticed uh, at least one of the cameras still has a cap installed. Just wanted to verify if that was intentional. Uh, no, we just removed it. We just had it on during toilet ops, but it's removed now. Copy. We don't have ground station coverage at the moment, but we'll uh, get some better views of you once we do. Continuing to take your questions on social media using the hashtag AskNASA. The next one coming to us, are the astronauts allowed to bring any personal items to the station? Yeah, this is a really great question, and the astronauts are indeed allowed to bring personal items to the International Space Station. This tradition dates all the way back to the Gemini program, and this is called the personal preference kit and it's changed a little bit throughout the years back in the gemini program astronauts were allowed to carry personal objects in a small gray nylon bag which could be closed with a drawstring 
Then for the Apollo era missions, the personal preference kit got a little bit bigger and sometimes the items taken on board were used later to be given to people as awards. For instance, a sphere of aluminum the astronaut Frank Borman took with him on the Apollo 8 mission was used to strike 200,000 medallions for those who contributed to the Apollo program. During the Apollo 12 mission, the astronauts did not just take the mission plaque to leave on the moon, they also took four thin aluminum lightweight copies with them. And of course, some pretty famous objects were carried during the historic Apollo 11 flight to the lun lunar surface, including three flags, the U.S. flag, the flag, of district, the flag of the District of Columbia, and the flag of the U.S. Air Force. And during the space shuttle era, the contents of the personal preference kit were limited to 20 separate items, which had to fit in a 5 by 8 by 2 bag. The bag also had a weight limit of 3.3 pounds, which is fairly similar to the personal preference kit used today on the International Space Station, both by the Soyuz spacecraft and the SpaceX Crew Dragon. The personal preference kit can be up to 3.3 pounds for personal preference items. Many astronauts bring musical instruments to the space station and leave them there for future use. For his 39th birthday in 2017, European Space Agency astronaut Tom Thomas Pesquet, who just splashed down on Monday as a part of the Crew 2 mission, was surprised by his Expedition 50 crewmates with an alto saxophone that they had conspired to be delivered to the space station and somehow managed to keep hidden from him. Some of the other items that astronauts bring with them in their personal preference kit include camera gear or favorite pastimes and of course photos of family and loved ones. A little bit of background and flight history of Crew Dragon. 
The development of Crew Dragon started with the Cargo Dragon. Dragon was designed from the beginning for flying humans to space, so much so that even the first Cargo Dragon had a window. Before we could fly humans, our teams implemented a number of design upgrades to make sure both Dragon and Falcon 9 were suitable for flying people, and then put both vehicles through thousands of tests to prove their safety. To date, SpaceX has successfully completed 30 flights of Dragon to and from orbit since 2010, including 27 trips to the space station. Dragon is capable of carrying up to seven passengers to and from Earth orbit and beyond. It is the only spacecraft currently flying that is capable of returning significant amounts of cargo to Earth and is the first private spacecraft to take humans to the space station. Dragon is fully autonomous, which means it can basically fly itself, but also features full manual override capabilities in case of emergency. Standing at almost 27 feet tall from the bottom of the trunk to the top of the nose cone, as you see there on your screen, Crew Dragon is composed of two main elements. The capsule, which is designed to hold crew and pressurized cargo, and an unpressurized section. That part is known as the trunk. The trunk is where the solar arrays are located. The nose cone at the top of of the capsule protects the docking system as well as the guidance navigation control system. The nose cone opens for docking and remains attached to the Crew Dragon spacecraft, unlike the previous version of Dra Dragon, and that helps toward our reusability efforts. Opposite of the nose cone is the trunk. It provides attachment points for Falcon 9, the Dragon capsule, and cargo. Like I mentioned before, that's where the solar panels are located. One half of the trunk is actually co covered in those solar panels, and they provide power to Dragon during flight and while on station. The other half contains a radiator that rejects heat from the active thermal control system to space using SpaceX's new PICA tiling technology. The trunk also now has has new aerodynamic fins, which provide stability in the event of an emergency abort. In the event of an abort, Crew Dragon is outfitted with eight Super Draco thrusters, which will power the astronauts to safety. Crew Dragon's Super Draco launch escape system is a key safety feature of the Crew Dragon, giving the crew the ability to quickly separate from Falcon 9 and safely escape from the time of launch all the way to orbit, a feature that no other spacecraft in history has possessed. Crew Dragon is also equipped with 16 Draco thrusters used to orient the spacecraft during the mission, including uh, during apogee and perigee maneuvers, orbit adjustment, and attitude control. Each Draco thruster is capable of generating 90 pounds of force in the vacuum of space. Now, inside Dragon, the spacecraft is designed to accommodate up to seven crew members with modular seats that can be removed and replaced by additional cargo. The seats are made of carbon fiber and will be custom sized for any crew members flying on board. For this mission, we are flying four crew members. The control panel is centered between the pilot and the commander seats and consists of three touchscreen displays, allowing the crew to operate the vehicle and fly it manually. We've implemented, implemented several improvements based on findings from previous flights. Primarily, the changes made are in place to enhance the astronauts' experience. Specifically, Crew Dragon has a new backup entry capability USB charging points for ports for crew tablets and GPS antenna, and more robust trunk fins. We also updated the life support maintenance, hatch opening timeline, and adjusted crew supply packing procedures to improve habitability. SpaceX worked very closely with NASA to certify and approve all changes to the spacecraft. And there on your screen, we can see the crew enjoying 
some of their meal. Looks like uh, one of the crew members it has one of the MREs or meals ready to eat. Uh, enjoying that might be the cran apple dessert or cran blueberry dessert that we heard about earlier. And if you're just joining us, you're seeing live views inside the Endurance capsule where four human beings are on their way to the International Space Station. Earlier this evening at 8.03 p.m., NASA astronaut Raja Chari, who is the mission commander, Tom Marshburn, pilot, Kayla Barron, mission specialist, and Matthias Maurer from the European Space Agency, who is also a mission specialist, blasted off from the Kennedy Space Center, launching from launch pad 39A. They're on their way to the International Space Station, and their journey will take them about 22 hours to get there, but we'll be covering the entire trip up until the point of dock, hatch opening, and through the welcome ceremony tomorrow. Crew 3 is slated to dock to the International Space Station at 6.10 p.m. Central Time tomorrow. With a successful launch, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague Shaniqua Vereen, who will walk you through the next stages of flight. It's been a pleasure sharing in this excitement with you all today, but don't go anywhere. We'll be covering it all live. Go NASA, go SpaceX, and go Crew 3.
Hi, and welcome to the International Space Station Flight Control Room. You see dueling screens right now. You see the SpaceX control room on your right and the Johnson Space Center control room on your left hand of your screen. Mission Control Houston is set staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Team members here are trained in a variety of disciplines and monitor all station systems. Just like in MCCX or Mission Control Space at SpaceX, we have someone dedicated to talk to the crew members to streamline communication. We noticed one of the suits is still out. Hoping to get that put away and a little bit more protected when you guys have a minute. Dragon copies, we're just giving it a little extra time to dry, but we'll get it put away here in a little uh, couple minutes and report back. Copy that, much appreciated. You just heard live audio from the crew to the core talking a little bit about what they're doing inside Dragon. I was just discussing MCCX and us dedicating crew members to talk and streamline communication to the Dragon. This keeps astronauts from needing multiple conversations on different subjects. This role is the CAPCOM, which stands for Capsule Communicator. However, this person isn't talking with the capsule. That is a previous shuttle term that we kept around. That's SpaceX's core. The, capsule, the CAPCOM is speaking with astronauts already living aboard the space station. The CAPCOM sits right next to the flight director. The flight director gathers info and data from all flight controllers and leads the team through major milestones. He or she approves or declines suggestions based on pre-established flight rules. Other key members include the ADCO, who controls the attitude orientation of the space station. We also have the VVO, the visiting vehicle officer, who monitors and works with external teams sending spacecraft to and from the International Space Station. There's a flight surgeon, of course, who the astronauts get a chance to speak with on a regular schedule on a private medical conference line. Robo works with the Canada arm to maneuvering it to complete work outside the space station. When the astronauts are on a spacewalk, the Canada arm too is maneuvered by an astronaut within the station. There are many other positions and team members who monitor the station's solar arrays, the astronaut schedules, and even where every piece of equipment and cargo is stored. It takes a tough and competent team to make a mission successful. Dragon SpaceX for cabin temperature. SpaceX Dragon, go ahead. Wanted to check in and see how temperature is feeling overall for you guys. SpaceX Dragon, we are all comfortable for now, so good temp. Copy that. We do see an increasing trend in the cabin. We're going to take action to send a few commands just to stabilize that at the current temperature. Dragon copies.
let's talk a little more about some of the science our Crew 3 astronauts will be working on once they arrive at the space station. The ring shear drop investigation examines the formation and flow of amyloids without the complications associated with the solid walls of a container, because in microgravity, surface tension provides containment of the liquid. If you're wondering what amyloids are, they're fibrous extracellular protein deposits found in organs and tissues and are associated with neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's. Results could contribute to better understanding of these diseases as well as to development of advanced materials. The Smartphone Video Guidance Systems, SVGS, created as a collaboration between NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, and the Florida Institute of Technology in Melbourne, is about to get a test on the space station as well. SVGS is a low-cost, commercial, off-the-shelf implementation of the advanced sensors designed for automated rendezvous and capture of spacecraft. The system uses a camera to capture images of an LED beacon and analyzes the pattern of the illuminated dots on the, cap in, on the captured images to determine the range and orientation of the target. The system will be deployed and tested using the station's AstroBee facility, which uses free-flying robots to test new technology and software. If successful, the software could enable future use in multi-spacecraft formations of CubeSats or other small satellites, demonstrating this technology's potential advantages in other robotic proximity operations such as rendezvous and docking. As human exploration of space extends beyond low Earth orbit, an improved understanding of spaceflight associated changes in the risk of infectious diseases becomes critical to ensure crew health, safety, and performance. Host pathogen profiles immune cells from the blood and saliva of astronauts collected before, during, and after spaceflight. The findings of this study are expected to enhance NASA's current infectious disease risk assessment for astronauts eludicate the relationship to immunity during spaceflight, and support future development and application of effective countermeasures for health maintenance during deep space missions. Again, these are just glimpses of some of the hundreds of experiments the astronauts will contribute to while in space. You can see more on these and thousands of research projects that have taken place aboard the station by going to nasa.gov forward slash ISS science. SpaceX Dragon, all suits are stowed. Copy. Thanks, Kayla.
and that was a call from Kayla Barron letting the core know that all systems were good on Dragon. SpaceX Endurance, uh, we took some food and snacks out of bags 302, 510, and 512. Uh, ate a little bit out of all those, and the trash from those is back in the same bags. And Raja, I apologize, I didn't quite catch those numbers. Can you please repeat? Get the food was taken out of bags 302, 510, and 512. Uh, any trash from the food eaten is in those bags. Copy. Food taken from 302, 510, and 512. And trash will go back into those bags. Copy, sir. Dragon SpaceX for inventory. Blood SpaceX. As far as we are aware, there is no food packed in a 500 number bag. Wanted to check if you meant bags 310 and 312. You catch you out that 310 and 312. Sorry about that. Abby, thanks so much.
continuing to take your questions from social media. Be sure to use the hashtag AskNASA, and we'll try to get through as many of your questions as possible as we provide continuous coverage of Dragon's on-orbit operations. Next question we have, why does it take 24 hours to get to the International Space Station, but only eight to get home? That's a great question, Kate. And I'm no rocket scientist at all, but I would say it's always orbital mechanics. So we know that everything in the solar system revolves around the sun, so objects are never in a fixed location. That means spaceships can't take a direct path to their destination. They need to go around and catch up to the International Space Station. Sometimes that can range to, like today, uh, 22 and a half hour rendezvous with the station or like you said it can take eight hours to get back to the ground this is all due to where and when um, when we launch and where the space station is usually on trips back we're gearing towards the space station being over the u.s or some in proximity somewhere in proximity so there is a shorter transit back to the ground for the crew um, this does not always align when we have launches, but we can get there just as quickly. Everything just has to align. But great question. Thanks for that. On your screen now, live views from both mission control centers that are currently monitoring Dragon as it makes its way to the International Space Station. Mission Control Center at Johnson Space Center in Houston on the left, and the Mission Control Center at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, there on the right. You currently are seeing live views inside the cabin of Dragon where the crew looks like they're eating meals. As you can see, the crew is enjoying their first in-flight meal. Each crew member has a breakfast, lunch, dinner, and a snack for both the nominal ascent and descent profiles. So that's three meals plus one snack for each crew, uh, going each direction for a total of 24 meals or and eight snacks. To account for contingency requirements, such as longer ascent or descent free flight periods, each crew has an additional day's worth of food, three meals plus a snack, uh, for both ascent and descent. So that's 24 more meals and eight more snacks. They, of course, have water up there with them, 64 liters or almost 17 gallons. 
This totals 48 meals and 16 snacks on the vehicle, which covers nominal and contingency ascent and descent profiles like Kate mentioned. The Space Food Laboratory produces thermal or heat stabilized foods in the pouches you see right there, similar to meals ready to eat or MREs that the military use, but developed to support the nutritional needs of astronauts in space. These are essentially prepackaged meals ready for consumption without any heating or additional ingredients. The Space Food Laboratory at Johnson Space Center also produces uh, rehydratable foods. You won't see that today just for convenience of the crew on this journey to the International Space Station, but rehydratable items include both foods and beverages. One way that weight can be conserved during launch is re to remove water for cer from certain foods. The Dragon SpaceX for shift handover. Go ahead. We have arrived at the end of our shift here on the ground, so I will be handing you off to Arthur. All right, here you're leaving, but uh, looking forward to working with the next group. Absolutely. Good luck on the rest of your journey to station and on your mission. Thanks. It was great uh, having you guys take us uphill. It was a wonderful ride, and we're enjoying the views up here. Can't wait to see the pictures. Talk to you guys later. And that was Rajas Chari to the core saying great words for the uphill that the core and the crew that the core took the crew on today, saying goodbye as we switch shifts in SpaceX's mission control. We'll have that also come in here shortly at Johnson Space Center, where Rebecca Wingfield, who led the team today in the launch, will pass off to Adi Bulos, another flight director here, that will be on another eight hour or nine hour shift for the rendezvous and approach part of the mission. On the SpaceX side, the core was Sarah Gillis, and we'll be switching over to Arthur Berrialt.
If you're just joining us, we are bringing you live coverage from the Johnson Space Center and Mission Control. Sorry. If you're just joining us, we're bringing you live coverage from Johnson Space Center, Mission Control, Houston, and MCCX over at Space X in Hawthorne, California. We're bringing live coverage of the Crew-3 mission launch to the International Space Station. There was a successful launch at 8.03 p.m. Central Time of, of Dragon and Endurance. And over the course of 22 hours after liftoff, Dragon will execute a series of burns which gradually raise its orbit to align more closely with the station. There are five major burns or firings of the Draco thrusters on Dragon that will bring the spacecraft close to station before we begin final approach maneuvers. The first major burn is the phase burn, which is performed at the first apogee or highest point of the in initial orbit and raises Dragon perigee or lowest point to a higher altitude. SpaceX Dragon, all water from bag 207 has been consumed. We're now working out of bag 203. SpaceX copies. Kayla, thank you. All water from 207, and you're now in 203. That's a good copy, Arthur. Just some comms there between, between the crew, indicating uh, progress on water consumption uh, with SpaceX core Arthur Berrialt. The next burn that Dragon will execute which is based on what our orbital data shows us, is called the boost burn. And it'll ra raise Dragon's orbit until its, until its orbit reaches an altitude just 10 kilometers lower than that of the space station. Followed soon after by the close co-elliptic burn to place Dragon on an orbit roughly co-elliptic with the space station. This means the crew will be about 10, kilom 10 kilometers lower than the station during their entire higher orbit around Earth. The fourth maneuver is the transfer burn, where we're raising Dragon's apogee, or the highest point of its orbit, to just 2.5 kilometers below station. And we round everything out with a final co-elliptic burn once again to maintain a, con a constant orbit beneath station, this time just 2.5 kilometers below. Then we'll get into the approach initiation and final stages of Dragon's Rendezvous with the space station. This is also when we will start integrated operations between the Dragon Control Team in here in Mission Control and Hawthorne. The teams will transition to integrated operations roughly 45 minutes prior to approach initiation. During the approach, SpaceX flight controllers will work in tandem with the NASA team in Houston to activate and test out a number of systems on Dragon, including bi-directional communications with the station using C2V2 system, which stands for Common Communications for Visiting Vehicles, and sets up a data stream from Dragon to the station, giving another path for Dragon telemetry to come to the ground and giving an additional command capability to astronauts aboard the station. They also maneuver Dragon to the proper attitude and initi initialize the navigation sensors used to the methodical approach to station. At approximately 2.36 p.m. Pacific, Draco thrusters on Dragon will fire for the approach initiation burn when Dragon is about 2.5 kilometers below station and just about 7 kilometers behind it. This will swing Dragon up until it's about 400 meters directly below the station. This maneuver will also move Dragon inside one of two safety zones around the station that requires a set of go-no-go no go poles with the different control teams. The first zone is called the Approach Ellipsoid, which is an imaginary shape measuring 4 kilometers by 2 kilometers by 2 kilometers, essentially a large three-dimensional oval. Before Dragon is given permission to move inside this ellipsoid, referred to by the teams as the AE, it is configured to be on what is known as a 24-hour safe trajectory. 
This means that if Dragon lost all control to its thrusters, that it would be at least 24 hours before its orbital path would take it inside the approach ellipsoid. Once Dragon arrives at 400 meters below station, it will be at waypoint zero, which is the first checkpoint during our approach. The vehicle can hold at 400 meters or continue on if all systems check out to approach to waypoint one. By this point, the teams will do a go-no-go no go poll for Dragon to move inside the keepout sphere, another zone that consists of an imaginary sphere around the station with a radius of 200 meters. It's another chance to confirm all of the guidance, navigation, and control systems are working correctly on Dragon before moving closer to the station and carries a requirement similar to the AE that Dragon's orbital trajectory would not bring it inside the sphere if control was lost, but this time only for four orbits, or about six hours instead of 24. Dragon's move from waypoint zero to waypoint one will swing it up and out in front of the station, pausing at a distance of approximately 220 meters. At this point, it'll be on what we call the docking axis, which essentially means that it's, a, it's directly in front of the docking port. The crew is headed to the forwardmost port on the International Space Station, the Node 2 forward port. That's where Dragon has docked for all of our NASA commercial crew missions thus far. Harmony, or Node 2, is where both of the international docking adapters are located. These were installed for new commercial space, spacecraft flights and any other future spacecraft that also use the international docking standard. Once Dragon is only 20 meters away at waypoint 2, the spacecraft focuses on aligning its docking system with the docking adapter. Dragon will then fly in and make contact with the docking adapter, giving us what we call soft capture. The soft capture ring then retracts until sensors indicate it's time for hooks to drive in place to give us a hard capture and firmly secure Dragon to the station. Then it's time for leak checks and hatch opening, which is currently timeline to come about an hour and 40 minutes after docking.
SpaceX uh, endures for tracking purposes. We took that grab sample about the time it was called for the timeline, record the actual time on the sample that that is done and stowed. Copy that, Raja. Uh, grab, tap, grab sample taken for the timeline. Uh, thanks for that. And Arthur Endurance, I'm not sure if uh, Sarah passed it off in the handoff, but just to make sure you guys have it on the books, we are closed out with 4012. Copy that, Roger. Uh, it was not passed along, so 
Uh, confirming now, 4.012 is closed. This is the third rotational crew to fly on a commercial spacecraft, and they bring a diverse set of experiences to today's flight. Crew Dragon Commander Raja Chari is a colonel in the U.S. Air Force. He holds degrees in astronautical engineering and aeronautics. Chari is also a combat veteran. Having flown the F-15E aircraft during Operation Iraqi Freedom and deployments in the Korean Peninsula. As a test pilot, he has accumulated more than 2,500 hours of flight time in various military aircraft. I'm Raja Chari, the commander of the NASA SpaceX Crew-3 mission to the International Space Station. I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but moved within a week to Cedar Falls, Iowa. My dad had come to the United States to get his master's degree where he met my mom. He got a job at John Deere, and that's why they moved to Iowa. One of the biggest things I took from my Iowa upbringing is sort of that inherent uh, community strength and the interest people had in, in everyone else succeeding and having a tight-knit community. I think I first became interested in flying at a pretty young age. My mom has pictures of me from back as a kindergartner being really interested in space flight. Uh, and I think as I got into junior high, the idea of going to the Air Force or flying became very appealing to me as well. And so astronautical engineering was a great way to be involved in the engineering for space. So at the Air Force Academy, there's all kinds of different engineering paths. You have the opportunity to continue on and do graduate school programs. It allowed me to go on and get a graduate degree at MIT, and it was a wonderful opportunity to, to take it to the next level. One path that is pilot training in my life, and another path is to continue in this engineering. I found I really liked engineering a lot more than I thought I would. And then uh, a friend of mine had started talking about test pilot school, and which I realized, like, oh, that's actually a combination of both of these things. 
So for me, I think I first started thinking about the idea of being an astronaut was about the 2008 time frame. But it dawned on me that, oh man, this is not just some weird, like I want to be an astronaut when I grow up. It's actually in the path that's realistically achievable. So what do you say? How about I introduce the 2017 astronaut candidates? Raja is a 39-year-old lieutenant colonel in the United States Air Force from Cedar Falls, Iowa. And so that was how I wound up on the path of applying. So on the SpaceX vehicle, my job as a commander is, is a fewfold. I don't need to tell Kayla, Tom, or Matthias how to do their jobs. They already know how to do their jobs. Uh, it's really more a matter for that 1% of the time where something off nominal happened, what is the best split of resources of, you know, what is the best interactions between those players to get the best result? And so managing those different uh, pieces of the puzzle is really, I think, what the crew part of the commander job is. It's really mind-boggling when you think about how much effort it takes to pe put people in space and then to sustain them in space. I think what's cool and why I like NASA is none of those people are doing it for the money. They're doing it because they believe in the mission. They're doing it because they believe in, in solving humanity's problems and pushing exploration. That's the reason people are doing it. I think if anything, it's taught us that we as humans have this great ability to endure through just about anything. You just have to put your mind to it. Pilot Tom Marshburn is suiting up for his third space flight. He previously flew on the Space Shuttle Endeavor in STS-127 and on the Russian Soyuz in Expeditions 34 and 35. While helping assemble the International Space Station on STS-127, Marshburn performed three spacewalks totaling almost 19 hours. The North Carolina native holds degrees in physics and medicine. My name is Tom Marshburn. I'm the pilot of NASA's SpaceX Crew-3 mission to the International Space Station. Not quite sure why spaceflight grabbed me the way it did. It found me, really, more than me deciding to uh, become fascinated with it. There's something about leaving everything we know behind, everything, not just our friends or family or home, but even the planet, going to places that we knew almost nothing about at the time I was reading about it and understanding how somebody could change. So it was almost like going up into heaven or something and coming back. That was just infinitely fascinating to me. I have three brothers and three sisters. Five of them had decided to become doctors. So the one thing I knew I was never gonna be was a doctor, because I didn't want to be just like them. But while I was in graduate school in engineering physics, I realized that everybody I was hanging out with, everybody I enjoyed being with, were either medical students or doctors. Maybe medicine something for me, and it turned out I, I loved it. Got so immersed with it that I actually forgot about space for a few years. Began to practice after that in Toledo, Ohio, where they had a life flight program, and that's where I did my residency for emergency medicine. I wanted to fly, and so I applied for the first class of what was then the Space Medicine Fellowship, and in 93, I showed up at NASA. I was all starry-eyed, excited, and ready to start learning about space medicine. I got to know the patients. I got to know the astronauts and the pilots that I would be working with later. And that was an enormous amount of fun. One of my first jobs then as a flight surgeon was to get shipped out to Russia to support the Phase 1 program, which is when we took NASA astronauts, put them on the Mir space station so that we could learn about long-duration spaceflight before we started sending astronauts to the International Space Station. There's something about working at Johnson Space Center, I think, that if anybody had ever considered flying in space or wanting to, when you show up and you see the incredible things that everybody is doing, it's hard not to get the bug to want to apply and become an astronaut. So I did three spacewalks and supported a fourth as the inside crew member. The main goal for us was to take these batteries, each weighing about 200, 250 pounds, and move them from the robotic arm that was holding them from the space shuttle and move them onto the space station. This had not been done before, so they're very thrilling. The long duration mission is quite a bit different from the shuttle mission. You really feel like you've become a resident of space, a resident of zero G, and you start to feel like you're getting an idea of how this works. I'm looking forward more to flying with three people that haven't flown in space before. This is a very unique crew. They are incredibly operationally savvy already. Those, I imagine from their prior jobs at ESA and in the military. I know they can do the job. There's no question about that. 
One of the great legacies of the space station is not just going to be the science, but very importantly, the international cooperation. It's not for survival, it's not for competition in the marketplace, it is for just exploration. And it's just a, a vibrant, wonderful place where great science is happening. Mission specialist Kayla Barron is about to make her first trip to space. It's also the first time Kayla ever saw a launch in person. The Washington State native has degrees in nuclear engineering and systems engineering. As a submarine warfare officer, she was a member of the first class of women commissioned into the submarine community, and she deployed three times while serving aboard the USS Maine. I'm Kayla Barron, a mission specialist for NASA's SpaceX Crew-3 mission to the International Space Station. I was born in Idaho. My family moved a lot when we were kids. We lived in Montana, Colorado, but for most of my middle school time and high school, lived in Washington State um, in a town called Richland, which is in southeastern Washington. I'm in the middle of three girls. My dad's an engineer, my mom's a math whiz and a runner. They always really raised us to be ourselves, which was really cool for me and my sisters to all kind of find our own paths. I knew that I would want to find ways to challenge myself and become a leader. That's how I first got interested in joining the military and ultimately got interested in attending the Naval Academy where I studied control systems and robotics engineering. When I showed up at the Naval Academy, I thought I wanted to be a fighter pilot. And we have this really cool training between our sophomore and junior year. I kind of think of it at like the Navy's job fair. You go spend a week with every single major warfare community, surface ships, submarines, aviation. And when I got to go underway on a submarine, I just felt like this is where I belong. It's not for everyone. It's kind of a fascinating world. You develop your own little microcosm under the sea because you have to be able to provide everything you need to live and work safely and also accomplish a mission within your own crew. The time on my submarine was the most developmental period of my life for a lot of reasons, but especially because of the operational experience and operational teamwork I got to do while we were underway when we were deployed. I actually never even thought about becoming an astronaut until after serving on a submarine. For me, it was all those parallels that really inspired me to want to apply and to believe that I even could. All right, NASA family and friends, our first astronaut, Kayla Barron. I found out that I was officially on Crew 3 when I was on my way to the Neutral Buoyancy Lab for spacewalk training. And I got a text from the chief of the office and he said, if you're awake, give me a call. So I gave him a call on my way into work and he said, Kayla, you're on Crew 3. And I was just so excited. Crew 3 is just such an amazing group of people. It's a really special crew because I think everybody brings a really unique perspective and different background. And so there's always something to learn. And whenever we're faced with a problem or have a decision to make, it's really interesting to see the different perspectives and how together we make better decisions and come up with more interesting solutions. I just feel super lucky to be with people who all have such diverse perspectives and experiences, but have really learned how to mesh and work together as a team. I definitely would want to thank my family for supporting me on this journey. They've always been there for me and pushed me to chase my dreams and been super supportive every time I stumble or fall, helping me get back up and try again. Without them, you know, to hold me accountable, to push me, I definitely wouldn't be standing here today. The second mission, mission specialist is Matthias Maurer. He too will be making his debut space flight. He will be the second European astronaut to fly on a Crew Dragon. Maurer is from St. Vendel, Germany, and is a doctor of material science engineering. He is the inventor of more than 10 patent applications and joined the European Astronaut Corps in 2015. Maurer has spent 16 days underwater during a NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations Challenge and has trained in sea survival training off the coast of China. 
I'm ESA astronaut Matthias Mauser. I will be mission specialist on the NASA SpaceX Crew 3 mission to the International Space Station. I was born in Germany. I grew up there and for the first 20 years I actually stayed in the more or less the same area. I was an ambulance driver for almost two years and I also financed my studies later on by working on the weekend. I studied two years in Germany, material science, then I went for a year to the UK, studied their material science and discovered how much you can learn while being in a different country. That was a huge inspiration for me and I decided to keep on learning more languages and continue in different countries. In 2008, ESA started the call to for new astronauts. Out of 8,500 applicants, only 10 candidates passed all the tests and were considered suitable for astronauts. I was one of them. I was always fascinated by space and what does an astronaut actually do. So an astronaut works with a lot of engineering stuff, we do science in space, we work in international teams and the adventure that we are able to live as astronauts in a combination of these four facts, engineering on the edge of what is possible, science, international teams and adventure that's only possible as an astronaut. I think Crew 3 is a kind of a rookie crew with only one experienced space flyer, Tom. But on the other hand, I don't feel like that we are rookies at all. Raja has a huge background in flying. Kayla, she has a huge background in working in a very difficult and highly technical environment. I don't consider both of them rookies. I believe we are an extremely good team. And after a few days in space, I think we will be there and it will be our environment. When we arrive on the International Space Station, we will run a lot of experiments. My focus will be lots of experiments in the material science domain. The name of my mission is Cosmic Kiss. It's a declaration of love to space and especially to the two only oases that we have in space, our beautiful planet Earth and the International Space Station. The patch is inspired by Guides of Nebra. It's a 4,000 year old disc that was found in Germany and it shows to me that people already 4,000 years ago watched the night sky and were fascinated with the universe. And they probably asked the same questions that we ask ourselves. How did the universe start? How did life come to our planet Earth? Is there life somewhere else in the universe? There's a huge number of people in Europe, in the US, in Russia, in Canada, in Japan. All those people that contribute that human spaceflight is actually possible. I want to say thank you to everyone who helped me to uh, arrive at that point that I'm today. I will be thinking of you when I fly to space and um, I send all my love to you down on the ground. And that's your crew. An interesting fact about Crew 3 is that they will also be the 599th, 600th, and 601st human beings going to space. Matthias will be the 600th. If you notice, there are four members. Tom Marshburn will not be counted because he's been to space before. But as the newer first-time flyers, they are the 599th, 600th, and 601 human beings to go to space. You're currently seeing live views inside the Dragon capsule.
And if you're just joining us, this is a live mission coverage of Crew 3 on its way to the International Space Station. And we want to hear from you. Be sure to use the hashtag AskNASA to ask, ask NASA to ask questions to us and see if your question can get answered live on air. We have one question here about sleep. The question is, how many hours of sleep do astronauts get during their journey to the ISS on Crew Dragon? I think we've mentioned before, but the crew has get there's a crew scheduler and they schedule everything up until five minutes for the crew and this depending on the length of the journey the astronauts can get as much as any regular night's sleep up to eight and a half hours of sleep um, but that also can change depending on if they have any media interviews coming up during this time or They have scheduled sleep periods, and usually that's scheduled up for eight to eight and a half hours. If anything changes or is dynamic during their flight, they will be awakened by the flight director or the core. But usually, and if they're on a 22 hour journey like they are today, they'll be scheduled for about an eight, eight and a half hour sleep period. Keep sending them in. We do want to hear from you. Please use the hashtag AskNASA to send us your questions.
you're currently seeing a live view from Mission Control Houston and MCCX in Hawthorne, California. Currently, the Orbit 1 team is on console in Mission Control Houston, being led by Scott Stover. And you'll hear today, once the crew is awake on station, uh, Capcom Koichi Wakata, who will be the voice you hear communicating with the station, Mark Svandahai. Koichi Wakata is a Japanese engineer and a JAXA astronaut. Wakata is a veteran of four NASA SpaceX shuttle missions, a Russian Soyuz mission, and a long-duration stay on the International Space Station. During a nearly two-decade career in spaceflight, he logged more than 11 months in space.